Good evening, welcome to another edition of Contemporary Living with Farming Hill. I am one of your hosts, Andre Hill. And before we get started with today's message, please subscribe to our um, YouTube channel just by clicking below. Also, you can share our YouTube page on Facebook. And you can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Facebook at Contemporary Living with Farming Hill. And you can find us also on Comcast Channel 19 every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time if you're in the Chicagoland area. And if you just want, just want to shoot us an email, you can shoot us an email at farminghill at gmail.com. So we're going to get into tonight's message. So we're going to talk about, for ladies, how to find your husband. So this, I hope this is a good topic. I hope it's a learning topic for each and every one of you. But today we're going to talk about how to find your husband. But we're going to, most importantly, we're going to go into the scripture of God and we're going to go into the word of God and we're going to study um, tonight in the word of God to find out about how to find your husband. So before we get started, as always, we start off with 2 Timothy 2.15. For the Bible tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to go into God's words. We're going to go into the scriptures, and we're going to find out tonight how can you as a woman find your husband. So before I get started, I like to kind of... Um, build my foundation, if you will. I kind of like to build my foundation as I begin to build this platform tonight on how to find your husband. So a lot of times we watch television and we look at shows like The, the Bachelorette or The Bachelor and we see all these people that's dressed good and, and looking good and they got the best champagne, they drive the best cars and, and things like that and we desire those things. But I want you to know tonight that we as the body of Christ, we don't want to be fooled by the things that we see on television. A lot of times we want the, the guy that's built and he got all the biceps in the world. He got pretty teeth and, and he comes from a good family background and he's a fitness guru. And that's what type of guy that we want. All right. And then a lot of times we go out and we get to searching and we all on social media um, looking for a mate or or we go to the dating games and and we get on these t television shows and things like that and search for a husband. And some of us, uh, some of us even take it even for even further. We we'll go to some of the events where they have speed dating and you talking to a guy for two or three minutes and you jump into the next guy all because you are in search of a husband. So uh, today we want to talk about how to find your husband. But let me even elaborate a little bit more. Sometimes we go out there and we get our the facelifts and, and we get the breast implants and the butt implants and we get the best things that money can buy trying to appeal to a man that we want to be our husband. So the thing about it is a lot of times we go about it the wrong way. So hopefully tonight that I can get you right back on track as members of the body of Christ and to let you know as a believer what God is expecting of you as a woman when you are out searching for a husband. So tonight's message is going to be how to find your husband. So as we go into the scriptures, and I'm going to take you to Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. And I have to ask you a question tonight. Are you prepared? Okay, so I want to talk tonight about are you prepared for your husband? As we read chapter two, um, Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, the Bible says, But speak thou things, not, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity, and patience. So I got a message I'm going to get to the guys probably tomorrow night or my next lesson about men being men. And when I'm talking about men being men, I'm going to talk about men not working. And I'm going to tell you as women, sometimes you have to you have to throw Jonah overboard. And when I say throw Jonah overboard, that is somebody that is not working in your household. That is a man that has not um, t has not take, taken his rightful position in God's house. Or he has not taken his rightful position in your home. But that's just another message that we're going to evaluate um, later on this week. So as we read on, chapter um, Titus chapter 2, verse 3 reads, 
the aged women likewise, that they may be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things. As we read verse 4, it says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And this is important. So one of the first things God wanted the older women to do was teach the younger women. And they, they wanted the older women to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. Not only that, they wanted the, uh, the older women was supposed to teach the younger women on how to love their children. So I got to ask you tonight, are you prepared for your husband? So a lot of times we run around talking about we want a husband. But I have to ask you as a believer of the body of Christ, are you prepared for your husband? So a lot of times we like to say, well, when I get married, when I get married, that's when I'm going to prepare myself and I'm going to be that perfect wife that's out there. Well, I have to ask you tonight as a believer of the body of Christ, are you preparing yourself to be a husband? I mean a wife. I'm sorry. So I, I think about 50 Cent and 50 Cent talk about how he used to have to dress for the job that he wanted. And how he had to be prepared mentally for the job that he wanted. So I have to ask you tonight as women, are you prepared for your husband? So Paul t tells you that the woman should be discreet. So you know what a woman that's discreet is? That is a woman that is not letting everybody know her business. She's not all on Instagram. She's not all on Facebook letting everybody know her business. Yet alone, she's not on the, what they call the telephone, or many of you call the telephone, talking to one girl after another girlfriend, telling everybody her business. Or she's on the phone with her mother, or she's on, on, on the phone with her dad, talking about how her mate is just no good and how he just don't treat her right. So the Bible lets you know that you as women should be discreet. And it goes on to say chaste. So to be chaste is, not, is, is a woman that is not giving it up to everybody. She's not sleeping with everybody she encounters. As a matter of fact, she, she has abstained from giving her goods up to any and everybody. So not only that, in chapter 5, Paul talks about the issue of keepers at home. So a woman that is a keeper at home, she keeps her home. She is faithful over the things that God has given her. That means she keeps her home clean. That means she vacuums. That means she washes dishes. That means that she makes sure that her house is neat and makes sure that her house is in order. So not only that, Paul says to love their husbands, but then he comes back and says um, be, to be obedient to their own husbands. Now, that's ironic. Paul said to be obedient to your own husbands. So apparently these women probably was out listening to somebody else's husband. Taking advice for another, another, another somebody else's husband, taking the advice from a pastor, but they couldn't even come home and be subject unto their own husbands. Not only that, as we look into the scriptures, also it talks about being false accusers. Now, what is a false accuser? A false accuser, according to Webster, is an allegation that is completely false and that the events that were alleged did not occur. So as a woman, you are not supposed to be a false accuser. You ever hear people that just ain't been there, but they always listen to, a, they, they, they have a story of their own. Don't know what happened. You got half the truth, but you out there telling everybody lies that you don't even know about. So the, so the Bible talks about being false accuser. And then it went on to say that the word of God not be blasphemed. So the word blaspheme means to show no respect to God, to speak irreverently, or impious of God. Now the word irreverently means lacking proper respect or seriousness, not showing the expected respect for officials, important or holy things, and piously lacking reverence of God. So Paul is telling you right now, if you're not abiding by the epistles according to chapter Titus 2 verse 1 through 5, that you are blaspheming the word of God. And you as a woman of God, you as a member of the body of Christ are to accept, are to, are, you are to, um, the word I'm trying to use is carry yourself, I'm sorry, in a manner that's pleasing to God, that the word of God may not and should not be blasphemed. As we read on, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 15 reads, 
In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So Paul talks about modest apparel. You know what modest apparel is? You're not all out on social media half naked because you want to get 2,000 likes. Your cleavage ain't all out and, and you just showing all parts of your body and you just trying to get try to talk about, I'm looking for a husband. What type of husband are you looking for as a woman of God where you exposing all of your body parts? Is that how God wants us to carry ourselves as men and women of God? Absolutely not. So that's why Paul comes to talk about modest apparel. As we read on, verse 10 said, but which becoming women professing godliness with good works. So Paul wants you to have good works and God wants us to go out and wants you to go out as women to display yourself in a manner that brings honor to the body of Christ. And it goes on to verse 11 reads, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she'll be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So God had always have an order for the man to be the head of the household and the head of man is Christ and the woman is subject up under the man. But we even have that order messed up in today's society. You ever go out and the people talking and they and they were like, well, you know, we know I know you're here with your wife and you and your wife can be talking business to somebody else. And they say, well, what the boss lady say? And we as men, we so foolish. We're like, well, she the boss. Let me see what she says. And I got to keep the boss happy. Well, that's not the order of God. The order of God is for the man to be the head of the household and the woman to become subject under the man. That has always been the order of God. Now, when I mean subject, that don't mean that the man is supposed to bully the way he's bullying the woman. Because if you really get into it, I believe in some of Paul's writing, he talks about how the husband and wife ought to be subject one to another. All right, so let's move on. Let's see what else the scripture has to say. We still on a message. Let me back up here. Here we go. We still on a message. How to find your husband. As we read in Paul's message, to Timothy, as he's talking to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, and it reads, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelleth first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So I was actually, I got to reading that. And when I got to reading it, it showed you that how the word of God is, is supposed to be perpetuated from one generation to the next. And as you look into the scripture, Lois was Timothy's grandmother. And Eunice was Lois' daughter. And the grandmother Lois taught Eunice, her daughter, the word of God. In return, Eunice imparted the same knowledge she had unto her son, Titus. I mean, Timothy. So that's why... Paul mentions, he said, and as I read it again, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in thee, which dwelleth first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it's in thee also. So Paul said, I know it's in you too, Timothy, because guess what? The unfeigned faith was in your mama and it was in your grandmother and it was passed and it had to be passed down to you. And apparently Paul knew these women work. He knew how they carried themselves. He knew everything about them because they were members of the body of Christ. And he talks about how their faith was unfeigned. And to be unfeigned means that their faith was sincere. It was genuine. It was heartfelt. It was wholeheartedly. We're still talking about how to find your husband tonight. But I have to fine tune you as women of God to make sure that you are on the right track when you are out there searching for a husband. And as you're going to begin to see in the word of God that you as a believer are not supposed to be trying to be out there searching for a husband. And we're going to get into that momentarily. But once again. Look at what Eunice, the grandmother, and, and Eunice, the mother, and look what the grandmother Lois imparted unto young Timothy. 
as we read on, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Likewise, ye wives, be subject to your own husbands. And see, apparently, Paul says the same thing that, uh, Peter says the same thing that Paul says. Subject to your own husbands. Like I said, we subject to everybody but, our, but your own husbands. Read, as I read on, that, it, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So Paul's talking about how the woman's conversation is supposed to be chaste. And to be chaste is to be virtuous, is to be pure, to be, to be a virgin. And understanding that the women did not talk to their husbands any type of way because they reverence and fear God that they talk to their husband with a chaste conversation. You be at all at Walmart and a woman cussing her husband out right there on, on lane three, acting a plum fool and be like, oh, well, I'm a strong black woman. You ain't going to talk to me like that. Nobody talk to me like that. She's out of order as a member of the body of Christ. Now I'm talking about the church. I ain't talking about the outside world. I can't talk about the outside world, but I'm going to deal with the church, the body of Christ, on how we're supposed to carry ourselves. So the Bible talks about how a woman words, how she should have chaste conversation with her husband because she loves him so much. She reverence God so much that she fear God that she won't even talk to her husband in any type of way. That's because she reverence God and she respects what she has. But I'm talking, are you prepared for your husband tonight? And how are you going to find your husband? In order for you to find your husband, you have to make sure that you are lined up to the word of God. As I read on, verse 3 reads, Who adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, a plating the hair, and a wearing of gold, and a putting on of apparel. As I read verse 4, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. So these women have begun to worry about how they look on the outside. We see it all today. They got all the fine jewelry on and, and they, they got the weave down to their back and their nails is about all the way about 10 feet long. And, and you see they got all these fancy things on, but inside, God, that's what God's looking at. They, today's society, they are so worried about how they look on the outside, but inside of them is, is corrupt. They full of hate, they full of envy, they full of jealousy, and they fix themselves on the outside. But guess what? God is looking at the heart. So even in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, Paul was concerned, Peter was concerned about the inward man as well as God. As I read on verse 5, for after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So Paul, Peter wants you to know, once again, that you are daughters of Sarah. And by you being daughters of Sarah, you are to carry yourself in a manner, once again, that's pleasing to God. So God is not worried about how you looking on the outside. I don't care how many tummy tucks you get. I don't care how many breast implants you get. I don't care how many new clothes you get. God is concerned about one thing, and that one thing is, the, is your heart and what's inside you. Because what's inside you eventually is going to come out. As I move on, and as we look at the, at the in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 through 31, we look at the virtuous woman. And I'm just going to give you a few attributes of the, the virtuous woman. One of the things was that the virtuous woman was a hard worker. A lot of women, they don't like that because they feel that I'm supposed to work. That's my husband's job. I'm supposed to sit home and cook, and clean, and that's it. Well, you understand the virtuous woman, she was a hard worker. She worked and labored with her own hands. A matter of fact, the Bible said, if any don't work, they don't eat. It didn't say if a man don't work. I know the church quote, quote the scripture. If a man don't work, he don't eat. It didn't say that. The Bible said, if any don't work, they don't eat. As we um, Another attribute of the, the virtuous woman, she was wise and kind, 
See, she just went out there. She had some wisdom. She had some, some characteristics about her, herself that stood out. She was a wise and kind woman. Not only that, she was thrifty. You know, the person that's thrifty, they know how to spend their money. They know how to save. They're budgeting. Um, they're, they're out there looking for the deals. You know, today, we don't buy the expensive things and, and like people look, look down on you. Girl, shoot. I, I, I spent $300 for my shoes. How much you spend for yours? I spent about 50 Shoot. I ain't spending no $50 for my shoes. And that's the conversation people be having out there. And half the time, people are spending money and spending stuff on materialistic stuff that they can't even afford. So then it talks about verse, um, we look at one of the attributes, trustworthy. See, I'm a man and I trust my wife. So my wife is trustworthy. Not only that, she carries herself in a manner that's pleasing to God. She dresses in a, a way that's pleasing to God. She don't be running there talking about, what you think about this here? Did this showing too much? If you, if you got to go come ask your mate. If you're showing too much, guess what? You're showing too much. That if you're not comfortable in it, what you put on, well, perhaps you shouldn't be wearing it. So, and that's what I like about my wife. She she carries herself in a manner that's pleasing to God. You look at people like Michelle Obama. She carries herself that's pleasing to her husband Obama. She's not out there showing all sorts of body parts. You can look at um, Jackie Kennedy doing her, her days as the first lady. She dressed with style and class. Coretta Scott King, you know, Betty Shabazz, and the list can go on and on. People like um, um, Cecily Tyson. As I move on. Ruth, chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. And I, I didn't put the, you probably want to go and read this because I didn't want to go through the whole story of Ruth and Boaz because I know a lot of people y'all hear it time and time again. But understanding this, the story of Ruth and Boaz for the people that don't believe in working. When Boaz found Ruth, guess what? What she was doing. She was out there working. She was out there working in the field and she was working hard. And guess what? Boaz, he recognized her. So she got recognized when she wasn't even looking. So the question to you tonight is, how do you find your husband? The question is, you don't. Well, I can say, go back and say the answer is, you don't. He finds you. So how do you find your husband? The answer is, you don't. He finds you. For the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18.22, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So what does the word find mean? It means to stumble upon. So guess what? While you out searching, while you out on TV shows, while you out on the Steve Harvey show, and don't get me wrong, I like Steve Harvey, so no disrespect to Steve. While you out speed dating, while you out watching The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, while you watching Flavor of Love and you trying to come up with all these gimmicks on how to find you a husband, you're going to mess around to find the wrong thing as a church, as a member of the church, the body of Christ. So the Bible tells you, whoso find it a wife, find it a good thing and obtain, obtain favor of the Lord. I read some years ago, about maybe two years ago, it said 80% of the success of a marriage rests in the hands of, the, of a man. 80%. So I believe the scripture and I believe God's word in Proverbs 18, 22. Whosoever finds a wife, find it a good thing. Because one thing, when a man finds a wife that he really wants, and women, y'all are, and I, and I give y'all credit, y'all are loyal, y'all are faithful, and women will follow something worth following. Even when men act up and act a fool out there, y'all will forgive a man 20,000 times. But us men, too, they only going to forgive you one time and be like, shoot, I'm out. But those are the attributes God has put in a woman. And understanding your worth and understanding your value that you don't have to settle for anything. But you do need to be patient and wait on the Lord. Because the Bible said when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. You never know. You could be at the library one day. You could be at Walmart shopping. You could be down at Whole Foods. You could be at a basketball game. And you never know who's watching you. But make sure that you are carrying yourself in a manner that's pleasing to God and that you are carrying those attributes that we spoke of at the beginning of this lesson. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, as I get ready to close this message out. And the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. 
I will make him a help me for him. So the Bible says, I'm going to make him a help me, not a help me. And a help me to someone that helps the man where he's lacking. What a man's weak, she makes him strong. Where he's lacking, she supplieth. And that's why God made a man a help me. And then even in the beginning, God said it's not good that men should dwell alone. Napoleon Hill did a study of over 500 successful men over, a t uh, over a, uh, I think it was over a 20 year span. And one thing he found out about all, about, about all of the successful men that he researched and studied, all of them had two things in common, but I'll talk about one thing. And the one thing was that they all had strong wives in their corners that made them who they are today. So as I get ready to close out tonight, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel here at Contemporary Living with Farming Hill. Follow us on Facebook at Contemporary Living with Farming Hill. You can drop us an email at farminghill at gmail.com. And if you're in the Chicagoland area, you can catch us on Comcast Channel 19 every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time if you are in the South Chicago suburbs. And as always, we thank God for his unmerited, undeserving favor called grace. For grace is the total absence of any works. You can't work for grace. You can't buy grace. You can't sell it. You can't even tarry for it. It is simply what God has given to each and every one of us because we believe that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day for our justification. On behalf of myself, my lovely wife, Melissa, Contemporary Living, be blessed.